There you go. Let us be reminded these are actual scary stories. We do not often hear them preached about because they are scary. We don't even often know them because they are scary. And these stories scare us because they force us to face topics that we don't really like to wrestle with in our day-to-day -day lives. They force us to face death, power struggles, and how God may or may not interact with the world. It is easy for us to want to dismiss or push away these stories. We say things like, God works in mysterious ways, or we even ignore these stories altogether. We want to fix what is wrong with these scary stories. Often we blame only the ones in the Old Testament, but now we're on week three, and this is our second story in the New Testament. And we don't really want to deal with the possible implications because none of them seem life-giving or loving. For example, today's story begs the question, who would you behead? Now, as a musical theater person over the last couple of years, if you had heard the word beheaded, it would lead you to repeat this mantra in your mind. I'm going to teach you this mantra because it just makes it kind of fun. The mantra goes divorced, boom, boom. Beheaded, boom, boom. Died, boom. Divorced, boom, boom. Beheaded, boom, boom. Survived, boom. We're going to do this together just so to make sure you're all still awake with me. So we're going to repeat it and you're going to be the boom booms with me. Divorced. Beheaded. Died. Divorced. Beheaded. Survived. Now this mantra refers to the six wives of King Henry VIII. One of the primary influencers during the Reformation in the 16th century. In fact, historically, the beginnings of the Church of England have lots to do with Henry wanting to divorce his first wife and marry another woman. Now, as many of us know, when that didn't work out, the other woman, the next wife, Anne Boleyn, got beheaded. So the question then comes back once again, who would you behead? If you couldn't get in trouble because you were a king, who has made you look bad, feel bad, embarrassed you in a way that beheading while extreme seems like a good possible option? I mean, I get it, right? At first, this question seems hopefully ridiculous to most of us. Hopefully, we would automatically respond, we're not going to behead anyone. Beheading is clearly not nice. We should feel slightly appalled that I even mention it today in a sermon. Yet, beheading actually has a significant history for many cultures. It hasn't been that long since the guillotine and public execution were a form of societal entertainment. As I was thinking and kind of researching, it could be an entire academic course. Who would you behead 101? But for us today, as we think about this strange question, we ask it because our story that we read today is about the beheading of someone really important in our faith. Why was this person beheaded? Who got in trouble for it? And at what point does a person have enough power that beheading someone is not an act of violence, but an act approved by society? When is beheading someone all of a sudden not repulsive, but celebrated? It was celebrated when David beheaded Goliath. 
It is celebrated in the Apocrypha, which due to all of that Bible trivia I made you study, you should know what that Apocrypha is when Judith beheaded Holofernes. When does a violent death become okay? And who decides? The beheading of John the Baptist is when the reality of the dangers of Jesus' ministry become real in a way that is much more intense than before. This is when one of the main characters dies. It is not just someone in the background. This is when those who are in power are now paying more attention but doing it in a way where they are playing with the lives of others because of their own greed and fear. No one gets in trouble for the beheading of John the Baptist. John's head was placed on a platter and delivered as a gift to what many scholars think was probably a child. The child then gives it to her mother and her father, and the power plays that led to this death are deeply complex. But the implications remind us that while often people might say, if I have enough faith, it will all be okay. If I have enough faith, Jesus will set me free. We are being reminded quickly that if we are associated with Jesus, if we are associated with John, that these people are trying to change society, and changing society can get you killed. Scary, right? That, that was literally my next sign. I was thinking that too. I'm like, that's scary, right? And while we may not witness many beheadings, being associated with those who are challenging those in power can still get you killed. And one of the reasons we don't think about probably who we would behead is that most of us do not honestly have that type of power. We are not kings. We are not presidents. We are not leaders. We are not people with lots of money. We are not in charge of the stories that are spun from those in power with influence. If we hurt someone violently, we get in trouble. But there are still those with enough power who can decide who gets killed and who doesn't without repercussions. And if we look at today's story, God does not save John. John isn't resurrected. John. Remember John? I mean, John the Baptist, the miraculous birth of Elizabeth and Zechariah, John, the baptizer, the leader, of the one who prepares the way, is no longer around now to prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus is now once again on his own in a very different way. And yet I find it fascinating that Jesus does not respond to John's death with violence. Jesus instead, as we know from the Gospel of John, weeps. Jesus weeps. And even in the Gospel of Mark that we read today, Jesus then just keeps moving. He tries to find space to grieve other people come to him, and so he keeps living into the ways of love and not allowing for more death, even though he is sad. And Jesus, who we know to be the best representation of God's power on earth, does not respond with violence. He gives himself space to grieve. But as the people continue to follow him, he continues to choose to be their shepherd. His power and the way to move forward is through teaching and helping others grow into God's love. Basically, he just refuses to not be silenced. He refuses to stop sharing God's love. He refuses to live in fear. And so all of us as people who are standing up to the things that are hurting others must know that we may be beheaded at any time for speaking truth. We may make people angry. Because living in God's truth, we must be willing to name things in the hard realities. We must find life even in the face of death. Even when death makes no sense. This doesn't mean we make excuses or cliches. We name the injustices and suffering, and we live into those in a way that has been prepared for us with more authentic knowledge that God is present with us in the pain. 
God is still present in both the good stories and the places of comfort that help even when we are living with so much fear. Jesus reclaims the story and does not let the people with powers do unjust evil. And that is what I actually love about the musical Six, about the Six Wives of Henry VIII. They decided to take a story that is often focused on how they all died and turn it into a story about how they lived, how their lives mattered, how their survival matters, and the value they had before their deaths. And I don't think that the beheading of John the Baptist is often preached, not because we can't handle it, but it is one of those stories where when we focus on death, we miss out on the much more important information of the stories of John's life. And what is John's story? It is a miraculous birth of a man who reclaims the knowledge of God's love. It is a man who prepared us all to see the power of Jesus. And so may we, even in all the fearful and hard and difficult situations we name today, may we continue to prepare that same way for others. Because there are many who need people to prepare the way, many who need people, even in the midst of hard realities, to be a shepherd and tell a story that will truly bring not the questions of who will you behead, but who will you still choose to love? Because as we know, love is the most powerful weapon we have. Amen.